So without further ado, tonight's session will focus on the short story, one of the most challenging but rewarding of literary forms. So I feel I shouldn't go on, <laughs> given we're talking about the short story. So Alistair, I will let you introduce things further. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alastair Daniel, and I'm an associate lecturer in creative writing at The Open University and a recent PhD graduate. Um, I'm really excited and thrilled to be talking tonight to the writer Ratawut Labtaroan Sap. Um, Ratawut is the author of Sightseeing, um, an acclaimed collection of short stories, uh, which was uh, which won the Asian American uh, Literary Award and was shortlisted for the Guardian First Fiction Award in 2005. Um, his stories have appeared in Granta, in One Story, The Guardian, and Zoe Trope, among many other places. Um, he teaches fiction at Sarah Lawrence College in the US. And he's with us this evening, as Emma said, to talk about the unique challenges and the pleasures, possibly also the pains, of writing short stories. So welcome, Ratawak. Great to have you here. Thank you, Al, and thank you, um, everyone, for being here. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, in particular, to MK Litfest and to the Open University, to Emma and the whole team um, for, for putting this together. It's such a pleasure to talk to you, Al. Great. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And um, I'm going to kick off um, with my first question. So um, you're known as a short story writer. So I wanted to start by asking you what the attraction of the short story form uh, is for you. What drew you to short stories in the first place? And, and why do you keep uh, writing them? <laughs> well, I think like many young people, when I first began as a writer, I thought I'm going to write a novel. Um, and I really thought of the short story as a kind of apprentice form. Um, nothing could have been further than truth. I was quickly disabused of this notion once I um, started writing in earnest. Um, and, you know, many people, I suppose, have tried to th make claims about what the short story is as opposed to the novel. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking in particular, say, from the beginning of the genre with Edgar Allan Poe, thinking about it as a work of narrative fiction that can be read in one sitting in, in, in which um, all of its elements contribute to a singular effect or a single effect, I believe he says. Um, then there's the Irish writer Frank O'Connor's sort of definition of the short story um, in his study of the story, The Lonely Voice, um, in which he claims that the short story um, is primarily attracted to what he calls submerged population groups, the marginalized, um, and that is kind of a, a form that's intensely aware of human loneliness. Um, and so you know, there have been others as well since that, that I've thought about. Um, Flannery O'Connor talks about the short story as a complete dramatic action that reveals the sort of um, mystery of a human personality, I think is her phrase. Um, and one of my favorite definitions is from my teacher, Charles Baxter, the American writer, Charles Baxter, who talks about the short story form as being suited to um, impulsive action, characters who um, act on impulse rather than make long-term plans. Um, now, none of these, we can find exceptions to all of these rules and, um, and these descriptions, I suppose. Um, and there's a part of me um, when I teach or when I talk about the form that, that wants to throw these kind of definitional um, descriptions out of the window. Um, but I think for me, the short story form has, has, you know, maybe, you know, once I learned to kind of appreciate the form and its own kind of formal dignity, I began to understand that um, that to mistake to mistake length for seriousness is is a mistake. You know, um, I don't necessarily think um, that, say, Joyce's The Dead is any less of a work than some of his other works um, um, because of its brevity, um, relative brevity to, say, Ulysses. Um, and so, you know, the form began as an apprentice form for me and just ended up being a kind of formal obsession, you know? Um, and so I've always, I've always loved and found some of my most rewarding experiences um, as a reader in the form and, and, you know, just wanted to figure it all out now. Yeah, well, it's certainly a rewarding experience reading your, your short stories. Um, so do you think that there are particular subjects or situations that the, sto the short story form is, is particularly good at? You mentioned the um, 
uh, the Frank O'Connor quote about submerged population groups. Are there, are there certain situations that you find yourself drawn to as a, as a writer? Yeah, you know, I, I, I guess I suppose I, there are certain situations with the form that I find myself drawn to as a reader. So I think, you know, um, perhaps it's confirmation bias with the Frank O'Connor description, but I particularly love short story collections, beginning with, say, Dubliners, in which um, there's a kind of intense awareness, I think O'Connor is right, of the individual and their loneliness, but also a kind of larger awareness when you read the collection as a whole of a kind of community. Um, and so Dubliners and its descendants, and I count among those, say, some a book like Edward P. Jones is Lost in the City, and All Aunt Hagar's Children, or Juno Diaz's Drown, or any number of, say, um, um, yeah, um, any number of collections like Winesburg, Ohio, things like that, that I, I find um, have both a kind of intense interest of the individual, but also an intense interest in communities as well. Um, and so I, I'm one of those um, really obnoxious people who love to read stories in their collections. Um, and, and so um, that's always been a kind of fascination of mine. So perhaps that's one thing that I've always been kind of drawn to as a reader and have tried to figure out in my own work. So you mentioned collections. So maybe this is a good moment to ask you about your first collection, Sightseeing. Um, the Irish writer Anne Enright once described another Irish writer, uh, John McGahan's short stories as the literary equivalent of a hand grenade rolled across the kitchen floor. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, when I uh, read the stories and sightseeing, it seemed to me that that they're the equivalent of a hand grenade being rolled towards uh, Western stereotypes and Western cliches and ideas about Thailand. How would you characterize what you were setting out to do with, with the stories and sightseeing? It's peculiar, you know, because on the one hand, um... I tried to write stuff that I guess I would want to read one day. Um, and one of the things I did want to read as when I was writing that collection was a kind of representation of, of the life of those in the country that I felt like was more familiar to me. You know, I was driven by my own narcissism, I suppose, in some ways. Um, and so, um, so that was part of it. But at the end of the day, it all kind of amounted to me wanting to tell a kind of truth or my own kind of truth about the neighborhoods I grew up in, um, about the communities I felt a part of. Um, and it's fiction, mind you, um, about some of the things that I, I had witnessed as a, as a young person um, and um, that I kind of carried around with me um, as an adult. Um, just, um, and so, you know, I didn't go into it thinking, oh, there are all these Western stereotypes of the country that I need to sort of undermine. A lot of it was simply, I kind of wanted to see something um, on the page that felt familiar in some ways to me, um, to the kind of experience of, of the city of Bangkok in particular, and also other parts of the, of what it, what it felt like to grow up in that place in the 80s and 90s, really. Yeah. yeah, there's a, a tremendously strong sense of place um, in that collection, um, a real sense of, of the vibrancy uh, of life in Thailand. Um, and it's one of the things that um, was picked up in review. So when Sightseeing came out, William Sutcliffe, um, writing in The Guardian, plays, praised the collection's novelistic richness. Um, and I thought that was such a great way of describing it, that your stories teem with with life and the lives of the characters seem to carry on after the end of the, the last page. Um, impossible question, but how do you get that sense of novelistic richness into such a compressed uh, small form? It's so funny because when when people talk, I, I, I love that quote. Thank you for reminding me of it. And I took it. I was so flattered by it. But then part of me also took grave offense on behalf of the short story, as if the short story can only matter as a kind of descriptively um, in an analogy with the novel. You know, it's 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 good. And therefore, it's novelistic. Um, and um, however, anyway, all that aside, I think, um, you know, um, if I understand, you know, the description novelistic richness correctly, um, it makes me think of, again, the stories I admire that that managed to do that. And I, I've noticed often that stories that kind of have a novelistic density um, 
It has to do with the kind of density, not only of detail, but a larger vision of the character's life. Um, and so I think a certain something about texture, social texture, personal texture, um, about the way that the past, the present, and the future seem to be converging upon the scene um, in a story, um, as well as, you know, I love this sort of strange hybrid form that I think about when I think about stories like Alice Monroe's stories or Edward, some Edward P. Jones stories, in which you can kind of see the tableau of a whole person's life laid out before you, even if you're only privy to specific kind of um, incandescent moments inside of inside of that life. Um, and um, and so I think perhaps, you know, I, I, I often tell my students, you know, to pay attention to things like social texture, where the people come from um, as, as mattering a great deal, um, as well as to think about how a specific moment in a life or a specific series of incidents might sort of accumulate to give us a larger or a grander vision of, of, of a person's life as it was lived. Um, you know, one of the ways I do this is just, I ask people like I, for when I was starting to teach writing to students, um, I taught at a private high school in Manhattan and I was noticing that a lot of my students were submitting stories where nobody had a job. Um, and I thought, what kind of crazy world are you living in where nobody works? And then I looked around me and I realized I was teaching at a private high school in Manhattan. Um, um, but you know, the, the world of work can provide a sense of social texture and for a fiction writer it can provide you with a set of details and images to work with, which is always, always invaluable. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question at all, but when it comes to novelistic richness, I guess was the phrase, right? Um, but any kind of richness, you know, um, I think a lot about social texture, about place, about, um, but also about finding ways to give your readers a sense that um, the events described and narrated um, matter both in the instant that it's happening as well as um, inflect both what comes before it and what comes after it as well. Yeah, yeah it's something I really notice reading your work is that we, we talk a lot when we're teaching short stories about flashbacks and how to manage flashback, but you also use the flash forward a lot as well to, to gesture outside the boundaries of the story to to what's going to happen to these characters after the story ends and that that gives it such a sense of um of a, of a full real life that's continuing um on the page oh, thank you um so i mean we've talked a little bit about the novel and a little bit about the short story and the similarities and differences um between them um one of the things about your your collection is that the last story cockfighter um is 90 pages so um, that's really much closer to a novella than it is to a, to a short story. And I'm wondering how you describe the differences between the short story and the novella. Are there things that you can do with a novella that you can't do with a short story and, and vice versa? One thing you can do with a short story that you can't do with a novella is publish it. <laughs> you know, that's, right. that's sort of, that's, <laughs> that's one of the things my editor said um, when we were putting together the collection, she said, you know, the difference between a short story and no a novella is that, you know, you can't really publish the novella. Um, but I'll, I mean, I think she said it half in jest. Um, for me, I think, you know, with, with the piece Cockfighter and, and, and that, that length, you know, it's, speaking of novelistic richness, it kind of gives you the, the room to, to, to think about subplots and to think about sort of um it has the expansiveness of a novel with and and it requires the kind of rigor and economy of a short story so i think i thought about that a lot and i was thinking a lot about it a lot in particular when it came to some of my favorite novellas you know i know i'm talking a lot about my reading practice here but i think as saul bellow once said you know uh, or somebody once said um a writer is kind of a reader who's moved to emulation so i was thinking a lot about you know, works that I'm, I would be lucky to even be conversant with, but, um, but some of my favorite works of fiction being, say, The Dead, or Alice Mon some of Alice Munro's stories that she began to publish in the 90s, or Catherine Ann Porter's um, novellas in the book Pale Horse, Pale Rider, that the trio of novellas that she wrote, um, Old Mortality, Noon Wine, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, um, these kinds of medium length narrative fictions that um, gave me a sense of novelistic richness again, um, but also seemed to have the real economy of a story. 
with that particular story, it just wouldn't end. And I was just kind of, you know, and I, I, I'm afraid that sometimes when I talk in these kinds of settings, I sound like I know, I know, or I knew what I was doing far more than I actually did. Um, it was one of those stories that I began and it just wouldn't stop. And I was, I continued to be interested in it. And so, um, and so when I looked up, I was about 150 pages in and I thought, okay, this is something different. And, um, and then I had to hammer it into some kind of legible shape. I love that um that definition of the novella is containing expansiveness and rigor. Um that's um that's quite a tall order. Um we've um <clears throat> we've talked a little bit about the the strengths of the of the short story and the novella. Um could we maybe talk a little bit about the the dangers of the short mm -hmm. story as a form um the the pitfalls or the traps that writers who are setting out to write short stories um need to try and avoid or need to be aware of when they're writing short stories. Do you think there are any particular key pitfalls or things to look out for? I do. I mean, I think there's some aesthetic habits um, that come and go. You know, I think for a long time, for example, um, in the aftermath of, gosh, Joyce, <laughs> um, um, and certainly in my own education as a writer, I was always trying to write stories with epiphanies, you know, um, and um, every, my early efforts were all pale imitations of say Araby, um, in which a, a young person is driven to a particular act and then their sort of foolishness is made plain before them um, and the, the sadness of their own particular small existence. Um, um, and, um, you know, some of the pitfalls I think I only bring it up because I, you know, there was a period in my life as a teacher um, in which I saw a lot of what I felt like were um, weak epiphanies or or false epiphanies or where an epiphany was perhaps not the most narratively interesting um, um, development of of the right the narrative um, and. Um, this idea that anybody needs to change or improve or understand something as a result of their experience um can feel quite narrow and can kind of shut off um a young writer's capacity to sort of imagine alternatives um that that could be just as compelling um i often tell people like nobody needs to change or improve for a story to feel satisfying and um and i think you know so that's one pitfall another pitfall that i i i see mainly because i see in myself often is um especially during my younger days as a writer um is a situation in which i would create a character very much like myself give him a different name so that it was my secret um but then i never wanted anything bad to happen to this character nor did i ever want anything bad nor did i ever want that character to do anything bad <laughs> This led to extremely boring fiction <laughs> <laughs> and with a kind of idea of the fictional for fictional narration as wish fulfillment in some ways. Um, and um, and the, the, the more quickly I got away from that, the, the better I think um, and the more interested I became in my own work. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's, it's so interesting that you mentioned epiphanies that when I came up with that question, I made my own list of things I thought were, pit, were pitfalls and epiphanies were right at the top. <laughs> yeah, it has to be earned. You know, not everybody can pull off the Joycean miracle. And when it's done, it's beautiful and it's amazing. But um, but it, when it becomes a narrative reflex, um, it can it can it can feel like a, a kind of limiting of the narrative imagination. Yeah, it's when these things calcify into a, a sort of compulsory route that people have to follow that mm -hmm. the problem arises yeah. um wonderful so um i think now would be a really fantastic time if you wouldn't mind it would be great to hear you read from your work oh would great you like give us a little reading okay great well i'm gonna read um i'm gonna read from a short story called in the 90s it's not in sightseeing but um but i wanted to read it to this particular audience because one of the things that i often ask um my students to do is is write an act of literary homage um and um this is a story that's an homage to 
just a brilliant story by Leonard Michaels called In the 50s, um, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, anyway, so this is a story called In the 90s. I'll, I'll just read for a, a few minutes and then I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. In the 90s. Everywhere you looked in the 90s, something was being torn down, something new being built in its place. Canals were filled in for city roads. Slums were leveled, highways completed. Buildings inched higher and higher into the smog. Offices, hotels, condominiums, banks. Foundations for the SkyTrain were laid and ground had been broken for a subway system, a new international airport, a world-class convention center. Out of fields emerged shopping malls, housing developments, sporting arenas, parking lots. Gargantuan overpasses rose to span the city's more congested intersections, Klongtan and Silong, Sa Ton and Lam Sa Ling. The future was everywhere in the 90s. We were always being reminded of it. It was being constructed all around us, above us, under us. You practically had to wear a hard hat to keep from being hit in the head. Some of our parents bought their first car in the 90s. Some finished paying their mortgages. Air conditioners were installed. Kitchen appliances were purchased. Microwaves, water purifiers, food processors. We started shopping at supermarkets in the 90s, abandoned the morning markets. Bathrooms were modernized. No more squatting. No more buckets of water. In the 90s, we learned to shit sitting down to clean our anuses with toilet paper. The first time my mother used a new bathroom, my brother and I were summoned to watch her turds pirouette down the drain. Isn't that wonderful, she asked us in the 90s. And Anan and I murmured our agreement, dumbstruck, embarrassed, but also silently alarmed by the color and the consistency of her excrement. It didn't look normal. It looked like nothing we had ever seen. But it was the 90s. Nothing was going to get us down. We thought that the worst was behind us in the 90s. The military was out, democracy was in, there was peace in the streets, and the economy, oh, the economy in the 90s. It was booming, it was a tiger. We were going to be the new Japan. GNP, GDP, exports, median income, the stock exchange index all seemed ascendant in the 90s. The middle class was also ascendant and some of us were a part of it. Not rich, not poor, but somewhere comfortably in between a new breed of people who no longer had to work with their hands. Some of us were not a part of this, of course. Some of us still worked with our hands. But in the 90s, more than any other time, there was optimism about crossing the divide. Everybody knew somebody who had made a lot of money in the 90s. Biographies of successful businessmen sold by the tens of thousands. Fan Ti Ben Jing, The Dream That Came True, was the most popular television show in the 90s. Every Sunday afternoon, somebody would tell their life story before a live audience for an hour. Sorted, hard scrabble, pre 90s stories about poverty, abuse, neglect, disease, drug addiction, ungrateful children, etc. They always cried while telling their stories, and we always cried with them. It was always so moving to see this poor person weeping before a national audience. We were not yet suspicious of the things that we saw on television in the 90s. If you could have one thing in the world, the show's host would ask at the end of every episode, what would it be? And the person would say a little bit of money or a train ticket back to their home province or a prosthetic leg for their son or to find their missing daughter or dialysis. And invariably the show's host would produce such things and such persons for them. And more tears were shed from the joy of it all, the joy of the 90s, when the lives of the downtrodden could be made a little better by going on television. I lost my virginity in the 90s on a marble floor in a rich girl's condominium while Fan Ti Pen Jing was playing in the room with the volume turned off. I was practically howling from the momentousness of the occasion, from the cold and horrible embarrassment, and from the bruising on my lower spine, when the girl looked up from her seat astride me, peered at the television and said, a noodle cart. You could have had anything you wanted, and you asked for a fucking noodle cart. She crawled toward the screen's blue light to turn on the volume. A woman with an ashen face was weeping over a set of aluminum tureens. I had just told the girl that I loved her, 
This was said in a moment of profound panic, the likes of which I haven't experienced since, and which I now belatedly associate with the 90s. But all she could do was recline her lithe, sweat-drenched body against the edge of her parents' leather couch and remonstrate against the limited ambitions of the poor. Few of us understood why we said what we said in the 90s. Some of us wish we hadn't said anything at all. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. It's incredible how long ago the 90s seems now. Mm, uh, too, too incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you were mentioning that, um, that the story is is after or in the style of an, a Leonard Michael story. Um, I, I think I'm right in saying he's not particularly well known in the UK. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the relationship between this story and Michael's. Hmm. Leonard, um, the, the relationship is that in that particular story, which um, is a kind of inventory story, is, is what I kind of describe it as, um, in which the narrator of that story um, attempts to describe his life in the 50s. Each paragraph is about a sentence or two long and either begins or has the, uh, contains the phrase in the 50s inside of it. Um, and so that's that's kind of, there's, there's this kind of refrain that keeps occurring um, throughout the story. Um, and um, and that's that's superficially one of the ways that I tried to sort of emulate the work. It gives it such a strong rhythm, doesn't it? Such a strong, mm -hmm. strong sense of of movement. Yeah, and I mean, in that way, for the short story, which I know is the subject of today's discussion, um, I've always thought of the short story as being much closer in spirit to poetry than it is to the novel, um, and in which. Um, you know, the unit of the sentence becomes the sort of pressure being placed upon it is much greater um, as a as a resource for telling both the um, the explicit story as well as a kind of subterranean story living beneath it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we just heard you read the beginning of of that story, and one of the striking things I think about your work is. The different kinds of openings that you you use. So this story opens with a kind of bird's eye view of Bangkok, um, but some of the stories in sightseeing start in a completely different way. So they'll start with a really striking image, or they'll throw us straight into a scene. Mm -hmm. When you're working on a story, how do you decide what the best opening should be? How do you decide where to begin? I really don't decide until I'm revising the story, until I have a kind of firm grasp of what the hell I'm doing. Um, drafts one, two, sometimes three and four. It's just fumbling around in the dark, trying to get to the end of something and trying to see if anything is interesting. Um, and um, and so I, I often, you know, often where I begin in early drafts is not where the sort of published version or the final draft of the story will end up beginning. And it just depends on the story. You know, I think um, some, you know, you always want to get, at least in a short story, as close to the action as possible. What you mean by action, however, is is really worth thinking about for me, you know. And sometimes the action can be a kind of mood or a kind of larger bird's eye view of things um, that that establishes something that becomes really, really important for for the story later on. Um, so it's not that I think you know one must religiously begin in media res all the time. I think that that can become its own kind of um, tick um but but just simply just figuring out where the energy in the story is which is something you can only discover i think through reams and reams of drafts and just trying to figure out what the hell it is you're trying to do yeah. that, that leads me beautifully onto my next question which was about the drafting and the revision process i think one of the the most difficult challenges when you're redrafting your work is just to read with fresh eyes what you've actually written. Do you have any any tips or any thoughts about revision practices once you've got that first draft down mm -hmm. um, and you're sitting down to read it again? What what are you looking out for? What kind of things are you are you aware of that you might need to change? I'm just really looking out for opportunities to exercise the imagination, you know, um, and, and um, I think of revision as a an exercise of the technical imagination in particular, of all kind of the things that I know about writing and the sentence and um, story structure and trying to sort of 
exercise that part of my brain just to kind of bring something into relief, sharper, into sharper relief. Um, and I think increasingly I've begun to think about the act of revision as being actually the moment of inspiration. You know, I think we typically think of um, the creative act as, as, as one in which um, the artist with a capital A um, sits in their study and um, is struck by inspiration and um, as if out of the brain of Zeus arrives a work of art. Um, and I've often found that moments of inspiration occur much, much later in the process. And if we look at the examples of the writers who've come before us, one thing I love to teach when I teach revision is the 16 drafts of Elizabeth Bishop's um, poem, One Art, in which she begins as much as many of us begin um, with a mess. Um, and through the course of 16 drafts, successive drafts that she composed over the course of two weeks, um, you can see the kind of brilliance of Bishop is not really in the sort of compositional moment of that first draft, but is in the kind of techni technical, technically imaginative ways she deals and shapes the material, which is a kind of lump of despair of like um, in terms of language. Um, and shapes it into just something enduring and and, and incredible, you know. Yeah. I love that that phrase, a lump of despair. It's a it's a great description, <laughs> certainly of my own first drafts, and um, probably the second and third. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one one of the things that fascinates me about about sightseeing and your your work more generally is the use of the first person, the the eye voice. Um, it's a technique that we saw there in the in in the nineties, although it only comes in. A little bit later in the story um and it's a technique that you you use throughout sightseeing in fact all the stories in sightseeing are in the first person um mm -hmm. usually from the point of view of, of children or, or adolescents what's the the attraction there for you what's the attraction of the first person i love i love a restriction and um and a, a constraint and um, the first person feels to me one of the narrowest kinds of points of view you can deploy um and and so that's that's part of it's part of it is my own sadism I think um, I also think that um, not all first person narrators are built equally and in several of the stories in that book in particular um, I was thinking about the way that just because a person is telling a story it doesn't mean that it has to be their story um, and so a lot uh, there are several first person narrators in that collection who who much like say um, the way that Nick Carraway operates in Gatsby or Ishmael operates in Moby Dick, they're there and they're present in the story and they're participating, but they're also trying to tell somebody else's story. So the mother who's going blind in the title story, for example. And I would even say um, um, the brother in, in one of the other stories, uh, in a story called At the Cafe Lovely too. Um, and so I think that's what drew me to it. I also just love the way people talk, you know, and um, and, P and the first person expresses itself and what can it, what it can reveal. Um, and so, and in thinking about the collection as a whole, I really wanted to give people a sense that these were a collection of first person voices and that together they created a kind of a chorus inside of the book. Wonderful, thank you. Um... I have so many more questions that I want to ask, but maybe I'll make this the last one and um, then we'll throw it open to um, the questions from, from the chat. Um, but just to, to follow on from that, really, I think one of the things that, that you're doing with the first person is that you often like to give us two characters for the price of one, mm. um, so that we get the young protagonist who is the person who is doing the things in the story. Um, but we often also get the much older narrator who's looking back on their younger self. And that, that's a really difficult trick to pull off to give us a sense of both versions of this person at, at the same time. Um, what's the appeal of making your narrators much older than the younger selves that they're, um, they're writing about in the story? Well, they afford the advantage of a kind of articulacy that perhaps they didn't have when they were young. But I would hope too that in the stories that articulacy doesn't necessarily mean that they understand anything about the experience better. Um, they can perhaps express it in a kind of vocabulary that a child wouldn't be able to if say they were five years old. Um, but that I hope 
um, that, um, well, I've always understood them as people for whom an experience happened and for whom the mystery of that experience has continued to endure or the bewilderment for that experience and the complication of those experiences have continued to endure. Um, you know, I mean, so many of those stories were born not out of autobiographical detail in my life. Um, it is fiction after all. Um, but with a set of feelings and images that I kind of carried around that, that have always felt um, strange or mysterious, or I've never been able to shake them. And the act of writing them was just a way to try to get it down and figure out what it was and try to sort of shape a story around it. Um, and so they may be older, but they're certainly not wiser. They can just kind of shape and organize um, the work in perhaps a way that when they were young, they couldn't. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes when we're writing, especially in a first person narration or any kind of narration, um, finding a narrator who can be calm enough to tell their story is, is usually very helpful. This is not to say that you can't write stories in which people are in the midst of a kind of frenzy. Um, and, you know, for Edgar Allan Poe, he's the kind of first poet of that mode, I suppose. Um, but that um, one way I understand a faced first person narration, the Nick Carraway narration, the, the first person narrator who tells a story who's not their own, is, is that they often tell stories of people who are incapable of telling their own stories. Um, so um, Gatsby with his obsession with Daisy, um, and Captain Ahab with his megalomania and, 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 and madness, I suppose. Um, and so, um, yeah, so they may be calmer and more expressive, but they certainly don't understand what they're describing any better, I hope. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Characters who, who lack self-knowledge are often the most fascinating mm -hmm. ones to write. Um, well, I would love to keep unraveling the mysteries of creative writing with you. Um, but I think it's probably time to to throw throw things open to the audience. Um, Emma, do we have um, do we have some questions? I, I see the chat's been been really busy. So, yeah, the chat has been teeming with questions. Um, so, Ratwood, I'm going to kick off with a question from Anne Weatherilt, who is an English literature PhD student here at the OU. Um, she refers to a reviewer back in 2005. He described your stories as intensely politicized and as an angry commentary on contemporary Thailand. So Anne's interested to know whether you agree with that observation and whether that implied critique of the story still ho holds true 20 years later. Well, thank you so much for that question, Anne. Um, it's a great one. Um, I think, of course, as a citizen, I have all kinds of anger. <laughs> especially if you live as I do here in the States. Um, and, um, you know, the work at that time was, I really felt like I was writing fiction rather than um, political pamphlet. Um, and I always think about a quote from the American writer Flannery O'Connor, who said that, um, when you write fiction, you don't have to put aside your beliefs. Um, but she says in her, her wonderful way, she says, your beliefs will be the light by which you see, but it will not be a substitute for seeing. And, um, and you know, of course, while I, of course, have very fervent beliefs that change daily sometimes about um, all that is wrong, and I can go on a Jeremiah ad, with my friends, with the best of them, I suppose. Um, my hope is that um, the stories tell a kind of truth um, about the characters' lives, um, and that it begins at that very basic level, that it feels true to the lives of the characters, and that um, embedded in that, of course, is a kind of set of beliefs about that may be born out of their own circumstances. So, um, and I think, yeah, yeah, that's how I feel. I continue to be very angry about the direction in which um, my country has gone, Thailand in particular. Um, but it's that's because I just love it so much, you know. Um, I just love the place, and um, and yeah. So perhaps it still pertains, but I I think it also depends on what one means by the political. Um, and and to me, you know, 
a story as seemingly apolitical as say um, Chekhov's The Darling, you know, has its own kind of political energy. And I, I always feel like if a story writer tells the truth um, in a, you know, captures something beautifully, that can be its own kind of politi politicized act. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thanks. No, that was beautifully expressed. Um, we actually have a couple of questions about uh, writing collections and the relationship between collections and individual stories. Mm -hmm. um, so we have Pat asking whether you write each story on its own mm -hmm. or whether you write them explicitly as collections and whether there's a difference between these two approaches. That's a great question. Thank you, Pat. Um, um, I write them on their own with the understanding that, um, well, I'll have an idea of a collection in mind, especially with that first collection. And um, But then I've always believed that the story must be able to stand on its own two feet, um, but is enriched by its um, neighbors, suppose, in a collection, um, by, its, by its proximity to its neighbors and by the kind of writer's larger vision um, that's suggested or implied by how they organize a collection. Um, I don't love to think of collections as sort of a short story writer throwing everything they've written in the past four years into a collection. You know, some of my favorite collections, I think, achieve a kind of formal and thematic um, dignity that, um, that only enhances the stories within it. I think, you know, Araby being next to the sisters and Joyce's Dubliners feels really sort of mutually enriching, um, even as those two stories on their own are able to sort of stand up um, without the aid of the other. Um, and so for me in my own practice, I just, I just write stories, you know, um, on their own. I just try to stay interested. You know, I try to think about less about write what I know than write what I'm interested in. And, um, um, I typically in the back of my mind have a, you know, as I do now, I have a collection in the works where I, I think, oh, this, this is something, a set of subjects or a set of feelings that the work will hopefully be, be returning to again and again in different ways. Um, but that's, you know, when it comes to the day-to-day -day thing, it's just like, I'm on page six, what the hell's happening here? What, where can I go next? Um, um, where can I, you know, how can I keep, how, how can I keep sort of the fires burning? And that's, that's usually how it goes. So actually that um, fits very nicely with a question that we have from Sue Watkins who is interested to know to what extent you plan your short stories and to what extent you just let them evolve? Zero, zero planning. <laughs> um, it usually begins with an image, a sentence. So many of my stories often begin with a scene or a character. Um, and, um, and this is not to say that my example is the right way to do it, um, but I just, when I have planned my stories in the past, I ceased to be able to surprise myself. Um, and I felt like I was kind of trying to twist the story's arm into a specific direction. Um, and um, it was just no fun. <laughs> it was just absolutely no fun. Um, and so I often begin quite in the dark. I have a notion. I'm not a complete idiot about it. I think about trying to describe... The situation. So that's work I just read. It just began really with that description. I had a kind of long list of things that I had been jotting down that had happened in the 90s that I was really interested in. Um, and I just really had no story. I just I just kept going around and I kept thinking, well, who's speaking? What is theirs? You know, and I, I really had no conception that there was a sick mother in the story until very, very late in the composition process. Um, and so it often begins with a notion, a feeling, an image, a sentence, a character. And then I just kind of go from there. And unfortunately, this haphazard method also means that um, sometimes I don't have a story in my hands. I just have a bunch of random sentences. But um, eventually, I try to salvage some of them into stories. Um, but I really, really admire those who, those the, the planners um, who are able to. Um, the planning really does come in revision, however. Um, in which I see the work before me and I see the kinds of things that it may be interested in, that I, I might be interested in. And then that's where the planning really begins. But in the compositions of early drafts, it's just playing in the dark. We actually have a question that relates to revision in a sense. A question from Jake who asks, um, oh, sorry, actually it's a question from Julian Crooks 
who asks, do you sometimes look back at your previous stories and feel as though you want to edit or improve them in any way? So I'm guessing these are published stories. Um, or do you see them as a part of your pathway in writing? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think it's Zadie Smith who wrote in one of her essays um, in Changing My Mind, maybe, who said, who describes um, being backstage at a literary festival and everybody back there who was reading that evening was furiously editing their published novels <laughs> before they went on stage. Um, and that I, I'm certainly familiar with that feeling of, um, of looking back at previous work and feeling as if I want to improve it in some ways. Um, but, but by and large, I resist it. And I just think about it as a kind of document in time um, that, you know, I would have written, that's how I would have written it then to the best of my abilities. Might not necessarily mean that that's how I would write it now. And that's okay. And so the second part of your question, Julian, which is really excellent about seeing it as a part of my path um, in the writing, um, I think is really is really helpful. Um, I've had to make peace with it. Otherwise, we can just go back over and over and over again. Although some writers do, it's a beautiful effect. You know, I think about Frank O'Connor revising Guests of the Nation virtually ad nauseum between the time it was first published in 1914, I believe, um, to um, 1956. Um, um, when he last revised it. So um, um, yeah, whatever whatever keeps us interested. But thank you so much for the question, Julian. Uh, we have a question from an, someone called Jocelyn and um, another question from Sue Reed, who have both picked up on the idea that in the 90s um, had a flavor of creative nonfiction or even travel writing at the beginning and then uh, sort of gained intimacy as you uh, continued. And so they're interested to know whether you're sort of deliberately playing with merging genres. Maybe, you know, um, I try not to think about genre too much and kind of think about character or about um, narrative effect or, or, or about ac accuracy of description, at least according to the character. Um, you know, I think when you write literature about Thailand, however, or when you write stories about Thailand, you can't help, as how your question so excellently kind of suggested, but um, have feel, at least in the English language, that you're entering a context in which um, Thailand as a sort of object of description, as in as a location in the English language, is often pitched to an audience who is not from Thailand. Right. Um, who will travel there ostensibly. Um, and for me, I think um, worrying too much about audience can be qu quite fatal for my writing. Um, and instead of audience, I just, you know, the American writer Don DeLillo has this great line I think about often where he says, I don't have an audience, I have standards, you know. Um, and some of those standards for me just simply involve um, accuracy of perception and accuracy of description um, and where it may fall gener generically in terms of genre is I feel like beyond my <laughs> beyond my pay grade and my ken I think I'm just trying to get in there write some things as accurately loosely and sort of emotionally truthful as I know how and and then get off get get out of people's way well that's interesting in terms of getting out of people's way uh, Jack has be, uh, Jake, sorry, has been asking, if you write concisely, do you risk sacrificing richness of description? And what can you convey to the reader by writing in a punchy style? Yeah, you do. You do. You know, there's nothing that I love more than, say, in Tolstoy, you know, 30 pages of a hunt. And it just, um, it's just a, a different form of transportation, I guess we call it. You do sacrifice it quite a bit. Um, and so I think... Um, you know, but not all short stories need to be written in a particular style. And um, I know some of my favorite short stories are descriptively very, very rich and evocative. You know, not everybody has to write in, say, the style of Hemingway, um, in which, you know, as beautiful as that work is, I think one of the ways I understand how image works is that um, in its kind of impressionistic brush strokes, um, Hemingway begins the image and the reader completes the image sort of in their mind, you know. 
Um, that level of minimalism needn't necessarily be the only way one describes things. So an American writer like Deborah Eisenberg or John Updike or Edward P. Jones is able to describe with great richness, but but they have to do so in a way that um, that matters very quickly. They don't have the length of a novel with which to accrue, um, a, for lack of a better term, um, imagistic or symbolic power um, um, that, that, that the novel form affords. And so it's got to count and it's got to count them, you know, um, um, and the reader needs to sort of feel however inchoately that it counts. Um, and so, yeah, um, I don't really subscribe to the idea that, you know, one can't describe richly in a short story. Um, you know, nobody's described snow as beautifully as um, I think Joyce does at the end of the dead. Um, but the sort of the beauty of that also has to do with the kind of emotional clarity of that ending for Gabriel Conroy. Um, and um, yeah, so that's a really fascinating question, but you know, you are constrained by, by length, but if you're doing it right, the short story is not short at all in its terms of its sort of descriptive power. So talking of being constrained by length, this is going to have to be the last question, although I'm afraid we haven't managed to cover all the questions in the chat, although I think lots of you answered. Thank you for all the questions, everybody. I just pulled them up now. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. Um, I've tried to choose ones where I feel you haven't already answered answered a question um, in, in a different form. But we do have a question from Sue Reed, which uh, picks up a little bit on... Um, what you've been talking about in terms of styles of various different writers and so she asks if you could say a little bit more about why you ask your students to write an homage um, of various writers and what you hope students might learn or unlearn in that process. I think we tend to overprize originality and um, and I think sometimes the pressure on a young student when especially when they're beginning to write is to try to figure out what they can say that's new. There's Ezra Pound's famous dictum make it new right, I think, which some of you are probably very familiar with. And, you know, at first, when I under, when I first encountered that dictum, I thought, oh, I have to write something original. But perhaps what he was saying is you have to make it new, it being this thing that we all share, you know, it being sort of the kind of experiences um, that people have been writing about from time in memoriam. And so I think sometimes an homage can provide, especially for a young writer with, with, with a kind of shape um, with a kind of um, um, set of formal constraints that could be really fruitful. Um, I think the sort of vast playing field of an empty page can feel very terrifying. Um, and I think as Camus once said, you know, um, and in, in the essay, in the lecture, Create Dangerously, that art, art dies by freedom and lives on constraints sometimes. And, um, and so, an homage can not, not only sort of renew your love for something, a piece of literature or a narrative that you absolutely love, but also make you pay close attention to it, its formal construction. And then when you sit down to write an homage, you know, um, um, figure out ways you can make it work for your own work, you know, what, it, you know, and this may not lead to something larger or a published work, but I think it can always be fruitful for, for a writer to do so. I mean, when I think of things that I know that nobody else knows, the amount of things is on maybe zero. <laughs> uh, your your diffidence is um, <laughs> is is uh, welcome, but yeah, may, maybe it's useful for us all to think that way. <laughs> uh, but but certainly that's um, it's not been our experience tonight because we feel like we've benefited from such wisdom. I'm going to hand over to Alistair to do the sort of formal thank you. Yes, I thank you, Emma. I, I, I second that. I've learned a lot from this evening. Um, so thank you all um, for coming along. It's been wonderfully illuminating discussion. I think you'll all agree. I hope you found it as fascinating as I have. Um, I just want to thank the Open University, MK Litfest, and all the audience members, and thank you for all your terrific questions. I'm sorry we didn't quite get through them. Um, and finally, I'd like to say a very big thank you to Ratawut uh, for sharing your time and your insights with us this evening. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so thank much. Thank you very much. And thanks so much to everyone for coming. This has been a pleasure.